Nine and a half weeks of daily news conferences. Never have we seen or heard more from political leaders in this country, all scrambling to stop the spread of COVID-19 and help those most affected by it. So who's winning over voters and whose popularity is taking a hit? Eric Grenier is the CBC's polls analyst. David Coletto is the CEO of Abacus Data. They both join us from Ottawa. And Christian Bork is the executive vice president of Leger. He's with us in Montreal. Hi to all three of you. Great to see you. Hi, Bashi. Hi there. So we're going to start with the federal scene. And, and David, I'll begin with you because you have new polling out that suggests a big jump in approval for the prime minister. Uh, what do you think or what did you find is behind that? Well, we found uh, almost a 20 point increase over a few months in the federal government's approval. The same kind of bounce for the prime minister in terms of his overall positive uh, numbers. I think I think it's it's really one thing that's driving this. It's that we are living through a crisis and, and Canadians are really rallying around his leadership. And the leadership, I know we'll talk about it, of premiers and, and other leaders in, in communities across the country. But for the prime minister, I think this has been a moment where any any anyone's views of him going into this crisis have, I think, been changed because the way that they are in evaluating his performance are on very different terms. And so what we see, for example, is partisanship isn't as strong. Um, if I told you a few months ago that as many Albertans approved of the federal government's overall performance, not just related to COVID, but overall, then disapproved, you'd say, Vashi, that's crazy. That's that's no, that's not the world we live in. <laughs> I would, That's yes. where we are today, right? Where even Albertans and, and people living in Saskatchewan who would normally be um, let me say, skeptical about things that the federal government are doing, are feeling better today about its overall performance. And, and that is in, includes the prime minister as well. Just quickly before we move on, I want to ask you what that means for opposition party leaders or what you found the data shows you there. Well, I think Andrew Scheer has had a very difficult time. His, his negatives haven't gone up, but his positives have not have actually gone down. And so Mr. Scheer has had, I think, a hard time connecting uh, with Canadians. Mr. Singh, same thing. I think it's hard to be an opposition leader um, during a crisis like this, whether at the federal or provincial levels. And it's because, you know, people are looking for action. They're not necessarily looking for uh, a whole bunch of alternatives or what, you know, questions about what the government should or not should be doing. I also personally think that Mr. Scheer has, has, has run himself into a little bit of trouble, that when Canadians are looking for politicians to work together, I think one of the only sources of partisanship in the whole system has often been with Mr. Scheer. And I think that hasn't reflected well on Canadians who were just looking for collaboration and cooperation, not some of the snickering that, that we had seen, that we typically see in politics. And I think that's why a lot of Canadians are feeling better about their political system today, despite the crisis that we're in. I guess the question is, uh, Christian, how long it lasts? And, and at the provincial level, you've seen uh, some changes in the numbers over the course of the pandemic there too. Yeah, Mr. Legault started this uh, pandemic at 95% approval rating. I mean, nobody's ever seen numbers like those. <laughs> He's, he's now down to 81%, which still he's, you know, second best behind, guess who, Doug Ford in terms of, of approval rating within uh, one's own province. Now, in the, the slow recovery in Montreal specifically and the fact that the, the virus is still very much present and, and the death toll is not uh, as positive as Quebecers would, would want it, but still at 81%, it means that Quebecers are rallying behind their premier. Uh, I compare this to doing wartime polling. It, it, we, are, we see the same phenomenon when there's a threat of, of, of war or conflict. We tend to rally behind our governments and that's what Canadians are doing at a federal level, we just, we, we just talked about, but also at a provincial level. The only province where we see a, a, a lower satisfaction levels with the provincial government is in Alberta, uh, where there are some issues, mostly tied to the fact that it's the province where we see the greatest amount of Canadians who want to sort of uh, you know, kickstart the economy quicker uh, than, than uh, what the governments are, are doing right now. Other than that, for most premiers, and I would say Doug Ford and François Legault in particular, this has been uh, a godsend. Eric, we were talking earlier with the power panel about this, and uh, David Hurley brought up the point that support doesn't necessarily translate into voting intention. And, and we're sort of in this period right now where it's hard to determine if, if that will be the case, and, and it'll take a number of months before we're able to figure it out. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, that's absolutely right, because when we're looking at those uh, approval ratings for the uh, Trudeau government's handling of this, you're talking about 75 percent. But when we have uh, some voting intentions polling from Abacus, from Leger, you're talking about support more around 40 or 45 percent. Uh, and uh, even that number is going to be hard to sustain, because right now people are thirsty for leadership. And if you're providing it and you're not uh, you know, stepping uh, over over yourself uh, in doing so, that people are going to reward you. And we're seeing that throughout the country. We're seeing that in a lot of other countries as well. Donald Trump being one of the exceptions that maybe uh, he's one who's not using that platform in as good of a way as some other leaders. Uh, but if it is it going to hold until the next election? By the time that happens, we might be talking about uh, no longer uh, a second or a third wave. Those might be in the past. We might instead be talking about, all right, what are we going to do with this economy? Not as good of a situation when you're the government. But I think what the liberals are hoping is that the goodwill that they're building up right now, a lot of that will, uh, that capital will still be there for them to spend when there's an actual election that eventually happens. I wonder also, David, and I'd love for you to speak to this, uh, about the risks that are posed as we enter this very different phase of the pandemic, as we see economies reopen, as uh, Doug Ford gets a ton of questions every day about the level of testing, as uh, Justin Trudeau, the, pri the prime minister, gets questions about what, he, what he's going to do with the CERB. So after the financial aid is exhausted, let's say, two months, four right. months, six months from now, uh, what kind of risk does that pose to the level of support that these politicians are currently benefiting from? Well, I think we're, we're just ending the first phase of this, which was stabilization, make me feel at ease, you know, reduce my anxiety about both the health and economic risk that the pandemic posed. We're now moving into really much the recovery phase, and that's going to be about choices. And when governments have to make choices, they often disappoint certain people, right? So one of the things that the federal government has had license to do is basically backstop, you know, a third to half of the economy, um, all those affected by this, and not have the re real restraint on, on you know, its, its ability to spend and support all those Canadians. That, that you know, uh, cord is going to get tighter and tighter the longer we get away from this. So I think the real risk is governments, both provincially and federally, are going to have to start making choices about what kind of recovery and who are they going to focus on. So they're going to have to, in a way, pick winners and losers. And the result of that is going to be more uh, debate, more interest groups entering the fray, wanting a piece of, of that stimulus pie. And as a result, I think that's where some of these political leaders will come back to earth in terms of their approval ratings. Christian, your thoughts on the same? I would say one of the issues that opposition parties are facing right now is is lack of leadership. We're in a leadership race at the Conservative Party uh, federally. We were in a leadership race for the Parti Québécois here. They're nowhere in the news. Uh, last week, the Liberal Party, for the first time as a female leader from a, a visible minority, which ordinarily everybody would have been talking about, the new Liberal leader, uh, but then that's gone pretty much uh, silent. Uh, from that perspective, it's extremely hard if you're an opposition party right now to actually sort of pool those people who may be opposed to what the government is doing and build some kind of momentum. Uh, opposition parties have been basically just shut out. David, you look like you want to jump in for a second. Yeah, just very quickly. Yeah, we ahead. haven't had legislature sitting in, 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 a, in the normal way, right? And so the visuals yeah, of opposition absolutely. parties asking questions, it's one thing to do it in a Zoom call. It's another thing when you have the theater of the House of Commons or a provincial legislature. So opposition parties haven't had those platforms that they normally would to get those, you know, one liners in that then get broadcast on TV um, throughout the day. And we're in a Eric, Eric, we're right in the middle of a, a debate right now between all the parties about what par what parliament might look like going forward. I think it's safe to say it's it's not for a very long time going to look like what we have become accustomed to. So the opportunities for what David lays out there are probably going to be minimized to a certain extent, varying extent, but a, but a, a certain extent. Um, uh, Eric, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, and that's probably, like you said, going to last a long time. I think that it's also a bit of a, a double-edged sword, though, that if the legislatures were sitting and we did see the, the daily theater of uh, question period every single day, I'm not sure that the opposition parties would be able to um, prevent themselves from getting a bit too partisan. I think that it, when you look at where Canadians are, they still aren't ready for that level of partisan politics. So I think it would, it would be a bit de delicate for them to do that. So in a way, they might be uh, saved from themselves. But I think that once we do get into 
a bit of a, a more of a lull in terms of, of the news cycle, in terms of a fatigue with this story, uh, that people will be looking uh, more for something different, maybe something like what we used to have, and that the questions about why is this working not as well as it could, why you know is this person not getting support, what are you going to do with the economy because we're not seeing it bounce back at the rate that we might have hoped, that's when it will be uh, uh, tough for the government, uh, not only federally, but in, in every single province. But right now, opposition, uh, they still don't really have much of a role. And I think they're still trying to figure out what to do. OK, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks to all three of you for your time this evening. Thanks to Eric Grenier, CBC Polls Analyst, David Coletto, CEO of Abacus Data, and Christian Borg, the Executive Vice President of Leger. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.